The personal computer is the heart and soul of the modern economy and our digital lives. In this episode, let's continue to dig into the origin story of the microprocessor. Specifically, how did this give rise to this to eventually produce that? In this 24th episode of Chip Wars, let's take a look at how the microprocessor came to be. But first, if you'd like to support the channel, I've linked to Amazon below. Every purchase makes a big difference. But if you're here to learn how computing moves ahead, let's continue what we started in the last episode by looking at how Chip Wars began. Shall we play a game? That's one small step for man. The summer of 1969, a year of revolution. The U.S. flew mankind to the moon, the hippie movement planted flowers in Berkeley, and Silicon Valley engineers changed the business world by experimenting, failing, and innovating. Welcome to Chip Wars. Because of the reliable integrated circuits designed by some brilliant Fairchild engineers, Apollo 11's flight to the moon succeeded. But as we went over in the last episode, Fairchild Semiconductor was poorly managed. The prior year, Robert Noyce and Gordon Moore resigned from Fairchild to establish Intel. But rather than rely on government contracts with NASA and the Department of Defense, Intel focused on the private sector to grow their new venture. To survive, Intel needed to outsmart the competition. Let's see exactly how they did just that. Part 1. From Memory to Microprocessor. Federico Fagin, Marcian E. Hoff Jr., and Stanley Mazur. The 2009 National Medal of Technology and Innovation for the conception, design, and application of the first microprocessor, which was commercially adopted and became the universal building block of digital electronic systems, significantly impacting the global economy and people's day-to-day -day lives. Intel's original charter to design, manufacture, and market semiconductor memory. Intel's first customers, IBM mainframes, and the growing market for DEC mini computers. During the summer of 69, just nine months after startup, Intel shipped its first products, high-speed, smaller, static memory to replace magnetic core, larger, slower memory. By 1971, Intel shipped the world's first dynamic RAM. By storing significant amounts of information, Intel killed off the magnetic core memory market. So just after four years, Intel memory became an industry leader in semiconductors. Charter complete. Now what do we do? Let's see how the calculator gave rise to the microprocessor. Let's take a step back to look at the state of the electronics industry as a whole. HP was busy transforming into a diversified electronics company by introducing the first scientific electronic calculator in 1968. Marketed with the tagline, ready, willing, and able to relieve you of waiting to get on the big computer, these calculators were meant for the scientific, business, and industrial markets. It wasn't really a consumer product. On the other hand, Texas Instruments focused on the consumer, with digital clocks, LED watches, and especially their now ubiquitous calculators that are still insanely expensive today. A small Japanese electronics company wanted a piece of the action. Busycom asked Intel to make 12 chips for its upcoming calculator. But because Intel was really busy making memory for mainframes, the chip company didn't have enough resources at the time to produce the complicated design. Then, this engineer had an idea. Instead of making a calculator chipset, how about making a general purpose processor that could be programmed later as a calculator? Fast forward two years, and this engineer delivered four chips. A CPU for processing, ROM for storing custom software, RAM for holding data temporarily, and a shift register to send the data out. The CPU chip became Intel's first microprocessor. Success. But when faced with the 60,000 bill for Intel's design work, the Japanese company resisted. Luckily, some Intel engineers saw the potential beyond just calculators. But it still wasn't good enough to run an actual computer. So Intel renegotiated, retained the exclusive rights to the processor design, and publicly launched the 4004, the first fully integrated CPU on a single chip, announcing a new era in integrated electronics. So at the same time Intel took over the mainframe memory market, Intel now had the seeds to grow a flexible, general-purpose computing platform. But like platform owners today, Intel now needed to convince developers to create new things using their technology, to convince computer companies to sell the hardware, 
and convinced programmers to write the code. Basically, Intel needed to create a new market for smaller, cheaper, and more personal computers. Part 2. Sparking the Virtuous Cycle How the Microprocessor Nurtured Software Intel's initial goal was to convince computer designers to use the new chip. At the time, pre-written software was usually bundled together with ridiculously expensive hardware. Most computer designers didn't program their own logic functions because renting time on a mainframe or minicomputer was really expensive, and programmers were still a rare breed. Because these guys can get a little nervous. But Intel made an early observation. Sidebar. When a product overserves a market, like either it's too expensive, too complicated, or it has just too many features, the best strategy is to break up the product into smaller, more modular components in order to drive down the price. At the time, room-sized mainframes and refrigerator-sized mini-computers were tightly integrated expensive products. Each proprietary component worked exclusively within its specific computing environment. These mainframes also required expensive service contracts just to keep them up and running. Therefore, only large established East Coast tech companies could afford to make computers, and only mathematicians and engineers at large organizations knew how to use them. So in economic terms, the barriers to entry in the computer market were sky high, but modular design reduces complexity by breaking up a system into its discrete components. It lowers the barriers to entry. If more people could write their own software, demand for computer hardware might actually grow. Back to the story. Intel quietly assembled the pieces to support a new market for general purpose computing. So Intel modularized computing by creating the first software programming tools. This made it much easier for programmers to make the new microprocessor do new and interesting things. For a short time, these $5,000 software development kits actually brought in more revenue than Intel's microprocessors themselves. So while most Ivy League universities and East Coast tech companies focused on expensive computers for large organizations, Silicon Valley started paying attention to early adopter computer enthusiasts and hobbyists. Intel was on to something big. Part 3. The Breakthrough Just like the 4004 owes its existence to a Japanese calculator company, Intel's next microprocessor exists because of this innovative terminal. Originally, Computer Terminals Corporation of Texas commissioned Intel to make a single-chip 8-bit microprocessor that reduced the heating issues of previous terminals. The data point 2200 was to be a program terminal that didn't need a mainframe. Unfortunately, Intel missed its deadline. And again, Intel kept the rights to the processor design, but a healthy market to sell this new chip still didn't exist. Intel was playing it safe. Actually, at first, Intel CEO Robert Noyce believed shifting from mainframe memory to microprocessors was a potential mistake. His reasoning? Intel could sell multiple memory and shift register chips per computer, but only one processor. Kind of makes sense. Also, Intel was afraid of competing directly with his customer base who integrated Intel's memory chips into their own processor designs. But Intel eventually took a risk and launched the 8008, just one year after the 4004. The 8008 was used in mainframe computer terminals, calculators, bottling machines, and industrial robots. But its ability to perform data character manipulation made it more attractive to a growing group of new customers, the homebrew computer hobbyists. You're really into computers, huh? Yeah. Part 4. Intel creates a new market. The stagflation of 1974 tested the management of the entire semiconductor industry. But smart companies never let a good crisis go to waste. Seeing its corporate and government business suffer, Intel aggressively shifted its strategy toward a different market, consumer electronics. Existing consumer electronics technology was limited to radio, TV, and calculators. For home computers to be a thing, they needed to be more simple than mini computers, but more advanced than scientific calculators. Another sidebar, when products underserve a market, that is when they don't meet expectations, Smart companies take an integrated approach. This involves bringing together components to function as a coordinated whole. For Intel, an integrated approach of providing support systems and peripherals would make it easier for consumers to build their own computers. So while Intel succeeded in the mainframe market with a modularized strategy focusing on components like memory and shift registers, it approached the consumer market with an integrated strategy by building the entire solution. Its customers just had to put the pieces together. But Intel's biggest advantage was that it was first to market. In 1974, in the middle of a recession, Intel introduced the 8080, 
beating its competition by over a year. All future competitors were compared to the standards Intel established. Intel's 8080 has been called the first truly usable microprocessor. But competitors put up a good fight. Let's go over three of them. Motorola, Moss, and Zilog. By 1973, Motorola was the second largest chip company after Texas Instruments. After seeing Intel's designs for the 4004, Motorola began work on its first microprocessor, the 6800. Shipping in 1975, it was effectively faster, had a software development kit, but it was late to the game. The 6800 had lower yields, slower production, and didn't integrate well with popular computer kits at the time. The worst part? The Motorola semiconductor business was badly managed. So, it resorted to a popular tactic weak companies use against their stronger competitors. It engaged in a price war. In the end, the 6800 was most popular in point-of-sale terminals. Then, a group of eight disgruntled Motorola engineers left the poorly managed company to join Moss Technology. In less than a year, they introduced the Moss 6501 and 6502, new microprocessors compatible with Motorola peripherals, but with a different architecture and, more importantly, a crazy cheap price tag, igniting a wave of innovative products in the consumer electronics industry. If Intel was the spark, Moss was the gasoline. While other semiconductor companies preferred large volume customers, Moss blew the doors wide open for the lower cost home computing and gaming consoles, including a growing population of hobbyists, tinkers, and future entrepreneurs. And lastly, Zilog. Founded in 1974 by former Intel engineers, Zilog introduced one of the most commonly used CPUs of all time, the Z80. The Z80 was binary compatible with Intel's 8080, meaning that it could run the same software. The Z80 brought computing to all kinds of industries. Besides these early desktop computers, you will probably use a Z80 today in embedded computer systems, like printing, faxing, voicemail, point-of-sale transactions, arcade games, consoles, and calculators. The Z80 is behind many of these innovations, but because home computers were more flexible and open, budding entrepreneurs were impulsively drawn to the computer. Now on its third generation microprocessor, Intel had the advantage. Among all the microcomputers based on Intel's 8080, including the one used in war games, the most famous was the Altair 8800. Featured on the cover of Popular Electronics, the MITS Altair 8800 was the original and first successful microcomputer based on a single-chip microprocessor, running the first successful operating system, CPM. The Altair was the real deal. MITS priced the computer at cost and hoped to sell peripherals at a profit. And the consumer market was ripe. Having seen the power of computing in calculators, arcades, and home video consoles, consumers were starting to get curious. The 8080 was the first microprocessor powerful enough to run a high-level language that enabled rich software development. So now, with all the pieces in place, Intel owned the 8-bit computer market in less than six months. This new home computer market was really different from arcades or calculators. These entrepreneurs started dreaming. A new industry began taking root. Meanwhile, a new generation of ambitious nerds were busy building computer platforms that would one day revolutionize the global economy. One of them would sell computers, the other, software. So thank you guys for watching this episode of Chip Wars and supporting the channel and all the research that goes into it. It's been a lot of fun, gives me a good excuse to get out and film on different locations and show you guys a perspective of uh, the human side of technology and the people behind it who've created a lot of the things that we use today. Surprised me to find out, especially in this video, that a lot of the uh, fax machines, uh, checkout terminals, uh, cash registers that we're using are based on technologies that were invented in the 70s. Seems like 1975 was really an important year uh, when it comes to new technologies being announced and released. And having said that, uh, we know that the iPhone 6 will be coming up uh, soon. Uh, Apple is going to be uh, announcing their new technologies this Tuesday. Uh, thankfully, I have the day off, so I want to take the uh, camera out and about and show you guys what it's like uh, over at Moscone Center in San Francisco, since we live close by. So uh, leave me your comments, your feedback, uh, share these videos with people who you think might be interested. 
Um, but most of all, thank you guys for watching and for keeping this uh, show and this channel alive as we continue to look at new technologies coming out, the people behind them, and how they might affect our lives.